Well, this year's uh, Hillman Prize for Opinion and Analysis goes to a colleague of mine at The New Yorker. And I'm very, very happy about that. Mr. Cobb began contributing to The New Yorker in 2012, and it was instantly apparent that the magazine had been lucky enough to find a great new voice, a voice that combines the rigor and depth of a professional historian with the alertness of a reporter, the liberal passion of an engaged public intellectual, and the literary flair of a fine writer. But don't take my word for it. Take his. Here's the first paragraph of Jelani Cobb's first dispatch at newyorker.com, posted on March 21st, 2012, about the Trayvon Martin case. Were the elements of the Trayvon Martin story, the plaintive cry for help punctuated by a gunshot, the image of Martin, 17 and looking young for his age, in a football jersey, the iced tea and Skittles he carried, were those elements not so indelible the events would seem like something from a Tom Wolfe novel. In a presidential election year, an unarmed black teen is shot by a Hispanic man in a county the African-American president narrowly lost, resulting in demands that the attorney general, also black, open an investigation. The miasma of racism in this storyline is compounded by a police department's refusal to make an arrest, gun laws that confuse jurisprudence with football and suggests that a good offense is now the equivalent of self-defense, and wild rumors of a black militia preparing to occupy the town and take the shooter into custody. That Al Sharpton will be covering a planned rally rather than leading it is perhaps an irony too far, even for, too, for Wolf. <laughs> More than that, the case, like similar ones, highlights the complicated matter of expectations and a black presidency. Call it the parameters of hope. And here is the last paragraph of his most recent contribution, the comment column in the current issue of the magazine. Freddie Gray died 20 years after Baltimore's first black mayor took office. Yet the statistical realities at the time of his death, a 24% poverty rate, 37% unemployment among young black men, show how complicated and durable the dynamics of race and racism can be. Last week, the cover of Time featured an image of Baltimore aflame with the year 1968 crossed out and 2015 penciled in. On social media, split screen images proliferated of the riot that followed King's death and the one that followed Gray's. The temptation is to believe that nothing has changed, but something has. Baltimore is blacker and poorer than it was then. It was not difficult to see who set buildings on fire that last week. The more salient concern is how cities become kindling in the first place. <laughs> Please join me in congratulating the winner of the Hillman Prize for Opinion Analysis, Jelani Cobb. I just want to say that I'm very honored to be here uh, this evening and my most immediate thanks have to go to David Remnick uh, at The New Yorker who this whole improbable thing started uh, out of a conversation about boxing with him at a party at the Schomburg, uh, and then somehow another culminated in this. Uh, and also my editors, uh, Amy Davidson uh, and Nick Thompson uh, at The New Yorker, who were very supportive of uh, the work that I've done there from day one. Uh, also, I'm just kind of, it's kind of heady to be in this room right now because there are people who I've admired for a really long time. Uh, Danny Glover, who uh, I'm certain does not remember the first time we met, but it was about maybe 20 years ago. I was in an elevator. Uh, I just come. I just come from the dentist, and I had a root canal. And Denny Glover got in the elevator, and I was like, "Oh my God, it's Denny Glover!" And so I was looking at him. My face was swollen, and I looked over. I said, "I'm a big fan of your work." <laughs> and he he looked at me and kind of was like, "Yeah, thanks." Um, and my brother, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, who's there, who um, I, we attended college at the same time at Howard University, and I'm glad that we are able to actually be having the conversations that we're having at the same time. That, uh, and your work, certainly, it invalidates the kind of outlandish ideas we had that somehow we could, in the dorms at Howard, when we were talking about 
actually participating in the dialogues that we thought were important. And I'm, and I'm honored to actually see you as my peer and my brother now. And also, I guess I, I could say Rick Hertzberg, who I have your book, Politics, uh, as kind of like my guide on how commentary should be done. And finally, I'm very honored to, to receive an award that Murray Kempton uh, received. His uh, book, Rebellions, Perversities, and Main Events, is kind of one of my other uh, Bibles on commentary uh, from when I first discovered him uh, in my 20s. There's some other people who are not here, and I have to mention them because the reason that they are not here is uh, integral to how I came to write in the first place or write uh, the pieces that I've written in the past year. Akai Gurley, Rakia Boyd, Renisha McBride, Jonathan Farrell, Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Jordan Davis, Oscar Grant, Anthony Baez, Amadou Diallo, Kajimi Powell, Ezel Ford, John Crawford, Eric Garner, Sean Bell, Victor White, Eleanor Bumpers, Yvette Smith, Jordan Baker, Miriam Carey, Chavis Carter, Wendell Allen, Dante Price, Kenneth Chamberlain, Ayana Jones, Katherine Johnson, Usman Zongo, Prince Jones, Patrick Dorismond. This is a partial, fragmentary list. Uh, a true rendering of a list of names would reach deep uh, into the reaches of American history. I've written in the hopes of keeping their names alive. I've written because they cannot. I write because a different world is possible, and we must always remember that. And I've written in the hope that we might move from contingent citizenship to actual democracy. I've written some of the stories that I've written because I'm the son of a man with three grades worth of education and from a small place called Hazelhurst, Georgia, who took it upon himself to teach his youngest son the alphabet as an act of insurrection, his large hand engulfing the boy's small one, a fugitive hope that there was power in words, and with that power and discipline and effort, those words might midwife some small fragment of change. I hope that I will not ever have to write another story like the stories I've written about Ferguson and Baltimore. I wrote a story last week uh, about Freddie Gray who died in a city with a black mayor and a country with a black president, yet his schools looked like the Jim Crow institutions where my father was educated for his brief schooling. His neighborhood in West Baltimore resembled the Negro Quarter of Hazelhurst, Georgia, 70 years ago. The past is said to be prologue, and sometimes it should be said that is just as often indistinguishable from the present and in writing, I've hoped to make some small contribution toward that not always being the case. Thank you.